And I've also had a request, all these requests, it's very flattering. I had done a poem last year called um, Ode to a Senior Drill Instructor. Um, and unless there's objection, I'd like to do that again. And everybody's saying, we don't know what that means. <laughs> do we have any prior service people in here? Yeah, there we go, yeah. Um, before I do that, uh, I found that it makes sense to explain my state of mind. Yeah. Uh, the mindset of this starts in high school where I'm, I'm looking around at culture and I'm saying, is this all there is? And to that ex extent, I have a poem here called Making a Man by Nixon Waterman. Interesting, it published in 1906, and he mentions college in there. Well, in the turn of the century, fewer than 2% of the U.S. population were graduating from college. So it was kind of interesting that he did this. But I think this is just, will put you in the mood that I was in for the next poem. Hurry the baby as fast as you can. Hurry him, worry him, make him a man. Off with his baby pose. Get him in pants. Feed him on brain foods and make him advance. Hustle him soon as he's able to walk into a grammar school. Cram him with talk. Fill his poor head full of figures and facts. Keep on a jamming them in till it cracks. Once boys grew up at a rational rate, now we develop a man while you wait. Rush him through college, compel him to grab of every known subject a dip or a dab. Get him in business and after the cash, all by the time he can grow a mustache. Let him forget he was ever a boy. Make gold his god and its jingle his joy. Keep him hustling and clean out of breath until he wins nervous prostration and death. Making a man, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so that, and that's the, the prelude to this. This next tale, Ode to a Senior Drill Instructor, can be said to begin in the summer between my junior and senior years of high school, specifically in a drugstore in St. Paul, Minnesota, on or about June 12, 1964, when I looked at the cover of a Life magazine in the rack with that date, and I said, that's what I want to do. And on the cover, was a picture of a U.S. Army captain sloshing through a rice paddy in South Vietnam with South Vietnamese for forces on the uh, following with him. And in fact, if anybody wants to, well, we're sitting here and has your smartphone, if you want to look up Life, Mag or, yeah, Life Magazine, June 12, 1964, I won't be offended, um, uh, you'll see the cover. And it's, uh, to me, it's just dramatic. All right, a few uh, more words. These aren't my words. These are, uh, I mean, well, I guess this, this is my poem, so these are my words. Commies. Um, most of us know. The, the great the post-World War II fear that the international bloc of communist countries were going to take over the, the universe. Uh, crucible, a container melt to uh, used to melt metal, hence any severe test. Latrine, a toilet. Airborne. Elite infantry soldiers of the U.S. Army receive, who receive parachute training, allowing them to be expeditiously transported to a hostile fire zone where they, in full combat gear, get to jump out of a perfectly good airplane into a combat zone. <laughs> police call. Troops arrayed in a wide line to pick up trash. KP, kitchen police, the longest 15 or 16 hours you will ever spend in your life in an Army mess hall is doing that. Cadre, non-commissioned officers, uh, the ref and then there's a reference to brown shoe army. You don't hear that anymore. The, now, the color of footwear worn by U.S. soldiers during World War II in Korea, and then they went to black foot gear in the 50s. Mordant, biting or caustic, mane, hair. Charlie, as in Victor Charlie, as in V.C., uh, phonetic alphabet. PT, physical training, campaign hat, Smokey the Bear hat, first shirt, senior enlisted man in a company size unit, two more, three more. EXO is an executive officer, lupine, wolf-like riot act, British law of 1715, which said that if 12 or more people were uh, read the riot act, they would either, and did not disperse, they would either be placed in jail for 10 years or shot on sight. 
Final preparatory note. Uh, from the summer of 1964 in the Life magazine, fast, fast forward to Augum, Augum, autumn 1965 to a U.S. Army basic combat training unit in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, where in 300 trainees were required each day to read the bulletin board for additional duties, like some of the ones I've just talked about. Um, Above that board was the company motto. Every unit had its own motto. And this one read, there are only two types of soldiers in this man's army, the quick and the dead. But we're changing that. Women now can join the party. <laughs> Ode to a senior drill instructor. Each generation seems to get its own unwanted war, which winnows out the public doubt that life's worth fighting for. Of course, the fates must then decree that some will get the call to lay their lives upon the line, induced to give their all. So in its turn, my own chance came with high school sheepskin one. I thought I'd found a novel way to flee life's tedium. My buddies had the normal plans, a girl, a job, more school, but I was lured by different dreams, a choice they thought was cool. For I was tempted by war's thrills, and Uncle Sam had need, had told us commies must be killed so Asia could be free. If I had fears, they were dispelled or little understood and saw in war that crucible to end my childhood. The Army had conscripted Dad in WW2, and he survived, so what the heck? It seemed the thing to do. Recruiters helped me beat the draft, obliged most eagerly, yet eyed me hard for my desire of airborne infantry. Because I was too young to join, I knew I must insist. Reluctantly, my parents signed the waiver to enlist, and so, the torch to me was passed, and as my time drew near, renounced all claim to innocence. Back then, life seemed so clear. I said farewell to all my chums, my spirits then ran high, yet on the train I forced back tears from watching mother cry. But soon that bustling army base kept me from feeling blue, for basic combat training served up all that I could chew. I labored at exotic tasks like cleaning our latrine, police call, road guard, and KP while still age 17. I shared a room with 30 troops in double bunk stacked neat with 30 more one floor above packed tight like sandwich meat. Our cadre, most were season vets, old brown shoe NCOs whose service in Korea's war had left them all gung-ho. No, they weren't there to hold our hands. A different army then. They taunted us unmercifully to forge boys into men. A grizzled Sarge ran my platoon. His mordant wit was keen. He liked to march us till we'd drop while chanting rhymes obscene. Our captain was a portly sort, his presence never seldom seen. The first shirt marked his 30 years, the XO looked too green. Then we beheld the SDI, a sergeant of first class, was spit and polished, blood and guts, a leader none surpassed, of Irish breed with ruddy cheeks and close cropped crimson mane, had fiery eyes and piercing voice, John Gordy was his name. Cast short in height with stocky build, John never seemed to tire. God help us when he led PT for fear that we'd expire. Was always neat in starched fatigues as through the ranks he sped, well shod in shiny combat boots, campaign hat on his head. And merely by his presence, John personified a spree, for on his chest that noble badge of combat infantry. Its musket set against the blue with wreath of silver leaves, a pin that marks an honored group, intrepidly achieved. Unheralded, 
that Enlum served to quietly inspire because soldiers who display that crest have slogged through hostile fire. Despite the years, I still recall we trainees all agreed our senior drill instructor was one tough old SOB. Though just one man, somehow he'd know when we had screwed up worst, parade ground or the rifle range, upon the scene he'd burst, he'd glare with eerie lupine eyes from which his temper flashed, his lips stretched taut and sneer beneath his handlebar mustache. Then as he read the riot act, he built a head of steam supplied by stalwart lungs that would explode in frenzied scream, a tirade from his lexicon. He'd carefully select, though idioms he chose were not politically correct. As rage then peaked, his voice would froth, abuse flowed out unchecked. You turkeys are starting to tick me off, or words to that effect. <laughs> so when he'd pause, we found ourselves were gasping hard for air once John had emptied out his lungs, he'd leave a vacuum there. For when on the receiving end of one of those critiques, well, you never quite got over his rhetorical techniques. Your tongue was tied, your mind went blank, your gut felt awful strange, your knees would knock, your hearts would stop, your pants you had to change. And even when he wasn't near, we still were on the hook from fear that his imagined gaze watched every step we took. We'd hear him growl, now get in step and keep a full canteen. Then check your ammo, wear dry socks, and keep your weapon clean. Yep. John went strictly by the book, which served his purpose well, for he knew best what we would find when we went off to hell. It's argued traits of leadership are absent when we're born, that anyone can learn to lead who dons a uniform. But I contend not everyone can be so simply groomed, for some seem ready to command on exiting the womb. Sure, anyone could teach a class that troops might memorize, but making them retain it all meant one must improvise. John's tenor voice taught us the drills, but lest he might, we might forget his boot upon our backsides posed an ever-present threat. To prove our worth, John sent us on, told us to do our best, to keep from disappointing him would be our toughest test. Meantime, the Army bungled, surprise, surprise, and instead of infantry, they trained me as a lousy clerk assigned to Germany. Well, back at home as draft cards burned, peace now, vast crowds would roar. Well, I schemed, chomping at the bit to be shipped off to war. It took two years to orchestrate, but I, without a qualm, got trained as a photographer, dispatched to Vietnam. And so, one night, stuff hit the fan. The skies were hot with lead. Twas then I thought I heard John snarl, Be quick or you'll be dead. Yes, from the past, that haunting voice gave me that extra push. Hell, I feared more of John back home than Charlie in the bush. Once Congress had to sanction war, conscription was its cost. Now presidents pick battles we can't tell we've won or lost. And folks today mouth gratitude to those in uniform, which strikes me odd for guys from Nam were spat upon and scorned. But drafted or enlisted, one belief we grunts did share that service to our country was a duty all should bear. It's likely that not all John's boys returned from that crusade. He made the best of what he had, which prompts this accolade. 
For in my case, John did his job. Yes, he helped me survive for some small tip he taught back then must be why I'm alive, because though I played no hero's role, I've tasted mortal fear from angry bullets biting air that blazed right past my ear. So whether it's at Arlington or some less hallowed spot, I'd like to know where John is laid to thank that patriot. And though you say you hate all war, for peace you'll always yearn, you'd better hope there's more like John when next it's your child's turn. Ode to a senior drill instructor, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.